optimistic person. And so that's what I'm excited about is gonna come out of these conversations, the briefing, the policy recommendations that hopefully I'll be able to get a first crack look at so that we can move into this space to fight it. I was so honored two years ago, although I was, it's unfortunate that it was two years ago and not just one year, but I was so honored two years ago to be asked to author at the time AB 2054, which then sort of transformed into AB 118, the Crisis Act. That was born out of data and research. Thank you, Mark, and Alliance for Boys and Men of Color and the hundreds of supporters and dozens of organizations that came out and said yes. But that was born out of research that said, how do we crack this nut from a different angle? How do we have an alternative approach to what we're seeing happen when folks either do call 911 or are afraid to call 911 because of the ramifications, the consequences to them, to their lives, to their livelihood as a result of making that call. When we know that 70% of calls that come into 911 are non-criminal, non-violent in nature, why do we then respond with a criminal potentially, not criminal, but why do we then respond with a potentially fatal, potentially violent response? Why do we respond with a tool that has limited tools in their toolbox? Why are we weaponizing de-escalation and responses to emergencies and crises without taking a pause and trying to understand, unpack, investigate, the reasons why someone made the call in the first place. Did they make the call because they want somebody to be arrested and charged and convicted? Did they make the call because they wanna potentially break up a family or force someone into unemployment? Or did they make a call because they need a resolution? They need some de-escalation to a problem. Intimate partner violence, we know that half the calls that should be made are not made. We know that in the majority of instances with intimate partner violence, it then causes additional sort of fracturing and stress on relationships, on families, on folks who are parenting or who are guardians. We know that we have a judicial and a legal system that doesn't create sustained safety for survivors. We know that we have a criminal, legal, and judicial and punishment carceral system that doesn't provide supports not only to victims, but to those who have caused the harm to help them break the cycles of violence and harm to others and also to themselves. We know that we have institutionalized a system that exacerbates racial inequities and perpetuates violence. We also know that we have community-based organizations, foundations, think tanks, advocacy organizations across this state that are actually dedicated to working through these issues and bringing some fairness, some justice, some restorative justice to these issues. So why not involve them more deeply into the solutions at a policy level. We have an opportunity to unpack masculinity, to really discuss what healthy masculinity can look like, to have a deeper conversation around empathy and compassion and vulnerability, to empower vulnerability and to see it as a strength, to use it as a strength, we have an opportunity to include restorative justice measures into how we deal with these kinds of issues that are permeating communities across the state. We have an opportunity to uplift survivors and to engage 
victim slash perpetrators. Because oftentimes, a victim of yesterday can evolve into the perpetrator of today and tomorrow. And we're really interested in breaking those cycles. We're actually really interested in unpacking some of those stereotypes and recognizing that that may also not be the case the majority of the time. So I'm embracing the existential moment that we are in as we talk about how we want to reimagine our communities, our neighborhoods, our families, our state legislatures and the policy that comes out of those legislative houses. Because I want us to get serious about ending intimate partner violence in our heterosexual communities, in our LGBTQ communities, in our communities of color, in our poor communities, in our wealthier communities, in communities with children, I want us to get serious about that. I want us to get serious about intervention programs and prevention programs that do address healthy masculinity and healthy relationships, recognizing that that may mean different things for different communities and different cultures and how we not impose our own stigmas and stereotypes onto other cultures as we're trying to get to a common purpose of community health. And that we don't always have to lean into convictions. We don't always have to lean into punitive measures and punishment. We don't have to lean into revoking someone's humanity or their future because of a circumstance, because of a pattern, because of trauma or ignorance or not being supported and loved in a way that someone can receive. So I'm excited about the kinds of recommendations that are offered in the report because they are thoughtful, pragmatic, they are critical and comprehensive, and they really empower us with the tools to reimagine how we respond and how we prevent intimate partner violence. AB 118 showed us how the state can invest in these kinds of alternatives and how the state can invest in alternative approaches to solutions. So I want you to know that I'm with you leaning into this bite that we're gonna take into this new apple that I'm gonna tell you is gonna make people afraid because we don't like to talk about sexual violence. We don't like to talk about partner violence. It makes us nervous. Sometimes it's very personal. It can get really subjective and it pits one person's story and trauma against another. And when we do that, we jump down into a rabbit hole that doesn't allow us to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is culturally specific, responsive, thoughtful policy that can be customized and that can work for all. So I'm grateful that you all are willing to lean into this very uncomfortable space. People don't like to talk about sex offenders. They don't like to talk about sexual crimes and they don't like to talk about intimate partner violence, but we have to unpack it. And we have to talk about what's inside our men and what's inside our women and where the disconnect, where the fragility, where the fear is coming from so that we can work to escalate solutions that heal everybody. I challenge us to make sure that we include economic injustice and disparities. I challenge us to lean into the racial disparities and inequities. How all of these institutions that have reinforced seeing black and brown and poor people as other 
contributes to this space. And at the end of the day, a lot of the intimate partner violence that we hear about, it's happening within the same communities. We're hurting ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. And these recommendations are about how we find a way to love and heal ourselves so that we can save ourselves and then save the rest of the world. So I appreciate you and I thank you for allowing me to share some words and I am standing with you in this fight in this new year. Amazing. Thank you so much, Senator Cam Logger, for such a powerful call to action. That was wonderful. Um, I'll now pass it along to Mark Philpart, the director of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, to frame the conversation and lead us through the rest of the briefing. Mark is extensively involved in the boys and men of color field and contributes to advocacy and programmatic efforts across the state through his role as a consultant or board member to several organizations. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tasia, and thank you, Senator Kamlager. Uh, we so appreciate your leadership in this space um, and the very full overview. Um, you have really covered the waterfront in terms of giving us a full picture of the complexity here. Um, and you know, for my part, what I want to do is just give people a little bit of background uh, into how we came to this issue uh, as a network that is focused primarily on boys and men of color and really transforming the systems that fail boys and men of color, their families and communities. Uh, we didn't originally start with intimate partner violence uh, being something that we wanted to tackle at the, in, at the beginning of our time as a network. Uh, we originally began uh, by thinking about community violence um, for black and brown men in particular uh, in the ages of in the age ranges of 14 to 25, you know, gun violence um, and community violence tend to be the number one and number two cause of death. Um, and so we began our exploration into violence there, uh, really trying to hear from our partners what was happening and how they were engaging in violence prevention and intervention. And what were the things that were at root the cause uh, for how they got into violent situations. Um, and as we unpacked uh, their experiences, uh, we learned that uh, for many of them, the violence that they were uh, committing in the street, uh, violence they'd been exposed to in the street uh, was really an outgrowth of their experiences at home. Uh, we heard from several people uh, the first time that uh, you know, I remember growing up and remember visions of my father it was him brutally attacking my mother or other accounts of people saying uh, the more my father went to prison, uh, the, the worse the violence got. And so, you know, we began to want to explore um, how we could be uh, active participants in the conversation around intimate partner and domestic violence. Um, because it seemed to be a feeder into this cycle of harm that uh, we've been uh, hearing about from the senator. And for us, that exploration, um, you know, began six years ago, uh, where we began learning, listening, and partnering with gender justice advocates, survivors, um, and, and also those who have caused harm. Um, and one of the key threads within all of those conversations uh, was that the current approach of relying on the punishment system as the singular response to partner violence wasn't creating safety, uh, but that it was reinforcing and normalizing patriarchal violence. Uh, so with that, we launched our campaign uh, in 2019. Uh, the title of our campaign is Healing Together. Uh, and we wanted to put that frame out into the world because we wanted to draw attention to the fact that healing doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. Uh, it happens in relationship to one another. 
Um, we aren't asking people to stay in violent or volatile situations, but we are asking people to recognize humanity, to recognize relationship, and to recognize the wholeness and fullness of what it takes to heal. Um, and so our campaign is really focused on three primary points, uh, engaging men in challenging patriarchy, uh, addressing the root causes of violence, uh, and really shifting away from punitive policies and systems that produce violence and harm, and investing in community-based approaches that promote prevention, accountability, and healing for all. Um, and, and for us, you know, we've had to take a deep look at all segments of the violence intervention prevention system. Um, and the, the one that has been uh, particularly challenging uh, has been better intervention programs. Um, you know, in California, like in many states across the nation, uh, this is the primary response to preventing violence. Um, and yet it happens after uh, the, the violence has occurred. And so this is the singular and sole really, really intervention for people who have caused harm. Um, these court mandated courses for people who have been convicted and have served time, um, they are essentially mandated to participate in uh, these programs. Um, and so in California, these intervention programs are primarily administered by probation departments, which is you know, the part of the punishment system. And those departments often fail to meet the needs of diverse um, uh, uh, constituents and people who've caused harm uh, uh, don't necessarily get all the things that they might need. Uh, we heard the Senator talk about some of the real structural um, uh, causes of violence and things that tend to uh, accelerate or increase the risk of violence in certain communities. Um, those things aren't addressed through these programs. Uh, and so we need to be taking a much more radical and thoughtful orientation to interrupting cycles of violence, fostering healing. Uh, and that's what this conversation is about. What are the things that people need in order to sustain safety? Um, the Cal IHEA researchers uh, have really done the field a, a great service in their uh, pr production of this report. Programs and services across the country. Uh, and based on uh, documented innovations in uh, BIP delivery in Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, Texas, and Washington, um, they did some in-depth analyses uh, and produced these recommendations, which we'll talk through today. Um, they also did several interviews uh, with key stakeholders in each state uh, and identified best practices that are important for California to consider implementing in order to prevent the recurrence of partner violence and foster healing and safety. Uh, the research findings and recommendations are compiled in the policy brief. Today, we'll focus on some of the highlights mentioned in the report and hear from advocates in California who are working in community to end partner violence and engaging with policymakers uh, to shift understanding and uh, our general approach to this critical issue in the state. Um, I'll just briefly say some of the best practices identified in the brief are uh, to secure state funding. Um, you know, we will hear about the need for state funding of these programs uh, from uh, one of our panelists, uh, Professor Alicia Varani. Um, another was to centralize the administration uh, by agencies outside of the criminal legal system, um, thinking about how we can centralize management of male nonviolence or nonviolent programming outside of probation departments and uh, in a way that is within the kind of state administration. Uh, other states are ahead of California in this regard, and it's important that we learn from them. Um, tailored programming and services is another recommendation, and we'll hear from Skip Townsend at second call in a few minutes about the importance of addressing the variety of needs that people have um, and inter-organizational agreements and coordination uh, is another important uh, recommendation. And we'll hear from Krista Colon of the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence uh, about the need for greater coordination and, and uh, fostering prevention. So with that, 
uh, I am going to turn to Skip Townsend, uh, Executive Director of Second Call in Los Angeles. Um, Skip, you've been working with men and people who've caused harm uh, to foster safety and healing for more than a decade. Uh, what are some of the wraparound supports that you've seen uh, people are in need of? Um, thank you, Mark, first of all, and I uh, thank the Senator for her great words. Um, I was thinking when she was speaking, there's not much for me to say because she definitely said it all. Um, so thank you for your great work. Mark, to answer your question, I think one of the things that I've seen is um, there is a triangle pull on the family whenever intimate partner relationship happens. And when I say the triangle pull, there is an advocate for the victim who is pulling to get the victim away from the abuser. And then there are people like myself who are facilitators of batter's intervention who is pulling for this, this abuser to be a healthier person so he can return home to the family. Um, but then there's also a pull for whatever children are involved. And the pull for the children come from DCFS where they want them to reunify. So do you see how we're all pulling in two or three different directions? And what it does is create chaos and confusion, not just for the victim, not just for the abuser, but also for the children. Um, so some of the wraparound services that are necessary and needed um, for batterers is we have the group discussion where in the group, um, there are several different um, people who have the lived experience who talk to the batterer so that we can um, go through a curriculum and get to understand what is my part? What is my role? What did I do in this case? But at the same time, um, there's going to be uh, services that are needed for the children to see mom and dad. And I think you mentioned this as well, Mark, I don't know where your healing came from, but to get the children to be able to start healing, to get to talk about it, let them cry, let them go through it, let them until it becomes normal to talk and it becomes healthy, a healthy outlet to talk about what they've seen. But in order to get the family together and get them back into a situation where we can have a healthy family is, is, something that's, that's totally necessary. So I just don't agree with pulling the family apart and telling the, the, the victim that you, know, you, you need to do better and do by yourself, or even that we have to rely on the abuser if the abuser is the money maker. If the abuser is the one who was making all the money, paying all the bills, well now because of this situation, um, the abuser might also be unemployed may also be, they, they might go homeless. There's just so many different resources that we need to wrap around this family that um, the average person doesn't think about. And, and before I end this question, I want you guys to think about this as well. Um, I would like to lie to you and tell you that these people come out of parachutes at night or they come out the sewers like Ninja Turtles, but the victim and the suspect come out the same home. These are families. It's, 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 uh, it's a civil war, it's inside the home, it's not outside sources. So we have to do everything possible to get these families to be healthy or else we have another generation that's coming right behind them that will continue that same cycle. Thank you for that, Skip. And I so appreciate the family focused orientation uh, that you bring. Um, and we know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, many of the people who um, are, in, are in situations where they either commit harm or have suffered harm, you know, have some experience with it as a child. And so um, childhood intervention is really critical uh, if we want to interrupt these cycles of violence. Um, we, I want to ask you one more question before transitioning to uh, Professor Alicia Varani. Um, but can you say a little bit more about why it's important that programs are restorative and what successes have you seen uh, with using restorative approaches versus uh, punitive approaches? And I know you're a, a better intervention program. And, you know, can you talk about some of the ways in which you've had to navigate that? Because there are certain things that you are required to do in terms of reporting. Uh, but then there are other spaces where you have leeway and can uh, advance some much more restorative or transformative justice oriented approaches. Can you talk a little bit about that for folks? Yes, indeed. And thank you for that question, Mark, because one of the things that happens as being um, certified for the county, uh, my program is also we're training in the state of Georgia. And the one thing that I see this parallel is that we are forced to come in with um, 
the punitive part first. First of all, we have to, before I ask you anything else, do you have the money? Are, are, your, are your fees up to date? Before we can even have a discussion. So to me, that takes the human element out of it. When we start off with that, we do the paperwork right before we do the, the group meetings, before we do the class. So at that point, I'm not identifying you as a human being. I'm identifying you as um, whatever your case number is, you know, A, B, whatever, whatever. Um, so that's the one thing. And getting directly into the laws and talking about the laws and going right and directly into what it was that they were accused of and talking about their accusations. Well, one of those things is I stopped them from being a human being. So at second call, what we like to do is we like to go back to the triggers. What are some of your childhood memories? I, you know, it's easy to see what they're running to, but I want to see what they're running from. What are some of the issues that went on in the childhood? Because the same thing that makes me laugh, eventually it'll make me cry. So I want them to go back and understand what were some of the things that they suffered through in childhood, some of the things that they called the childhood norms, um, which was actually dysfunction. And if I continuously go through dysfunction, it becomes normal to me and I don't realize it's healthy. So yeah, we like to talk about the laws. We like to let them understand the difference between a misdemeanor, difference between a felony and how to approach situations. But the one thing we want to do is take them back to humanity. What do they remember learning growing up? Because a lot of this cycle of violence comes from the childhood conditioning. It comes from the triggers. What they remember hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting and touching as a child um, eventually dictates their life. And violence is one of the main causes. So um, what I like to do, and I definitely want to stay on board with what the teaching is for the County of Los Angeles, what the teaching is for batteries intervention, but I also want to go a little deeper and let these individuals go back to their childhood trauma so we can discuss that. And that's where the restorative justice, that's where the healing comes from because now we have a plan of healing after that. And of course, we're gonna educate them on what they've done wrong, but healing is so important. Thank you, Skip. And I'm gonna uh, come back to you. We have a lot of questions popping off in the chat right now. I wanna encourage you all to keep putting your questions in the chat. We're going to come back to them. I'm just going to do a quick round of questions with the uh, panelists, and then we'll get into the audience questions. Uh, so Professor Farani, you uh, dropped the hottest report um, that we have seen in quite a long time uh, on this topic, uh, and would love for you to say a little bit more about that um, and share just you know, some of what you found. Um, it being spread around because, you know, I, I after Skip talking about the importance of healing, you know, I'm a former public defender. I was a public defender in Orange County prior to joining UCLA Law. And, you know, what I came to recognize really quickly is that there is nothing healing that goes on through the criminal legal system. And the criminal legal system has no expertise or experience. Out a little bit um, with these batter to enroll in a 52 week batter intervention program. Uh, it's a standard condition uh, when you're placed on misdemeanor probation, for example, for one of these crimes. Um, and then in addition, if a judge thought that perhaps my client had a substance abuse issue, they would order them to an additional substance abuse uh, class through the batter intervention program. So someone may be taking two classes every week for 52 weeks. Uh, The one closest to them, as we know in LA County, it's incredibly hard with transportation to get to these programs and then to determine what's the right program for them. And what I would see very frequently is that my clients would end up coming back to court 
uh, with a probation violation for a, a few different reasons. Um, maybe they couldn't enroll on time because they couldn't find a program that they could afford. Um, maybe when they went to the program and they presented a fee waiver from the court to the program, the program refused to accept the waiver and were forcing the person to pay. Uh, oftentimes people, if they had completed all 50 certificate to individual because they had not paid for their 52 weeks of classes. And so again, that person is in violation of program. Uh, a revolving door of incarceration. Uh, oftentimes, if there's a probation violation, the individual has a warrant, ends up back in custody. And then one of two things can happen from there if they end up back in custody, simply because they cannot afford a program, which, by the way, it is illegal to incarcerate somebody because they cannot afford something that a court has ordered them to do, that they have no choice but to do. Um, but nonetheless, it happens uh, every single day, right? Um, and so what would happen if the individual ends up back in custody is either a judge would violate them on their probation and say, okay, go and re-enroll in the class. That might happen and the person would get released. Another outcome is that a judge would, would say, okay, well, if you don't want to complete the program, you can spend two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months in jail, and I'll wipe the program off of your uh, probation requirements. And what that really shows us is that the court is not invested necessarily in the individual getting the healing, taking the accountability um, for what they have done, but they just want a piece of skin right from the person. And so it, it really um, exposes the fallacy that the court is the way in which people are going to find help and healing and to really understand the impact of what they may have done and how they may have harmed people and how they have been harmed. Um, and so really quickly, because uh, I know we're short on time, uh, you know, public defenders in Los Angeles County asked me to look into the specific impact of fines and fees in the domestic violence context. And so what we did is we called all 142 programs in the Los Angeles County region. We were able to reach 83 of those programs and conducted interviews. And our findings were that the median cost per class was $25 across the county. So for the entire program, that's $1,300 annually. And what we know from national data is that 66% of people on probation make less than $20,000 a year. So think about the amount of money people are, are pulling in and then the amount of money they have to spend on these batter intervention programs. It's quite substantial. Uh, and you can understand why somebody may make a choice to uh, pay for food for their family versus pay for their better intervention program, pay for a doctor's visit rather than pay for their class, right? And they should not have to be making these choices. Um, further, 86% of programs charge a registration fee, and this often becomes a barrier because an individual sometimes is not able to be assessed on the sliding scale until they pay that registration fee. So again, putting up another barrier to people being able to enroll in these classes. Then 23% of the programs we interviewed do not offer a sliding scale, even though California state law requires programs to offer a sliding scale. And what this really speaks to is that the law enforcement agencies that are overseeing these programs are not auditing them in the way that they should be to ensure that they're following state law and offering the programs to people um, on a sliding scale basis. Even when programs did offer a sliding scale, the lowest cost per week was $5 a week. None slid all the way down to $0 a week. Again, I mentioned fee waivers. So if an individual cannot afford to pay, a judge has the ability to issue a fee waiver to that individual. It requires a person to go back to court to know about this possibility and this option for themselves and to advocate for such a fee waiver. If they go back to the program, we found that over half of the programs did not accept this fee waiver. And so then the individual is stuck. The court has said, no, you don't have to pay. And the program says, yes, you do have to pay. And you can imagine how confusing it is um, for people to navigate the system. Uh, and then over three quarters of the class said that classes said they will not provide proof of completion if the individual has an outstanding monetary balance. Um, and so, it, you know, in addition to the uh, incredibly high rate of, of 
payment for classes, you know, people are um, have to pay a $500 court imposed domestic violence fee, $150 for every misdemeanor conviction, and any restitution that they may owe. And so you can imagine that the financial stressors, the logistical stressor of figuring out these classes um, may very well exacerbate the stressors that are a part of what happens when intimate partner violence occurs. Um, so it's, this is a huge problem, the fines and fees. And just finally, I'll say that, you know, one of the, the ways, and we've shown through other fines and fees legislation that programs that rely on individuals to pay for them are not really actually receiving the amount of money that is charged, you know, that is imposed on those individuals anyway. And so this is not a, a steady source of revenue for these programs or for the state or for restitution funds then really what we need to do is turn to the state and local governments to provide steady streams of funding, um, both for prevention as well as these intervention programs after harm and violence occurs. Uh, so I'll end there um, and happy to take any questions. Professor Varani, um, can you say a little bit about what's on the frontier? Um, what's the, the next horizon for this work? Yeah, you know, I think one of, and Skip pointed this out, is that the the, legis, the the state law does not allow for any individualized consideration of what somebody may need. Everybody's situation is different. And so in my view, we really need to change the law and not just have this standard 52-week program that everybody has to go through. It isn't necessary that everyone needs a 52-week program or not everybody will thrive in a group setting. Some people might need individual therapy to work through this. They may need it longer than 52 weeks, right? Everybody is different. Um, and often what I saw is that wealthy individuals in the courtroom with access to private therapy were often able to convince judges to waive the 52-week batter intervention program and use their therapy sessions um, at, you know, as sufficient for the probation condition. Whereas low-income folks who don't have access to therapeutic responses like that were not able to do that and were funneled into these um, very rigid, um, sometimes programs with curriculums from the 80s with a very outdated understanding of intimate partner violence, right? And so I think curricula needs to be updated and, and regulated in terms of its substance. Um, approaches to intimate partner violence need to be individualized. There needs to be far more funding um, upfront uh, preventatively and an investment in restorative justice approaches uh, outside of the criminal legal system. Thank you. Thank you. Krista, I'm going to turn to you. The California Partnership to End Domestic Violence has been the leading agency in the state that has been focused on these issues and has really um, up, uh, uplifted prevention as a key strategy for um, ending domestic violence. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that campaign and what prevention looks like um, from the context of your agencies uh, and what you're kind of doing to move that agenda to the state capital. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Um, so at the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, we have the great privilege of working with domestic violence service providers, many of whom also provide batteries intervention programs all across the state of California. And we believe deeply and firmly that domestic violence is not inevitable, that this does not have to be a condition that we live with in our communities. And prevention needs to be a core focus of what we do. Um, so often funding has focused primarily on victim services, which I will never tell you is not where funding should go. It is essential and important, and those programs themselves continue to be under-resourced. Um, but we have spent the last several years working closely with the state legislature to prioritize new state investments in prevention and really thinking about primary prevention to stop violence before it ever occurs in our families and in our homes. Working with youth to establish um, healthy relationship behaviors, help young people understand how to navigate conflict in um, their relationships, how to have healthy communication, helping to shift traditional gender norms and societal norms that allow violence to 
to foster and exist. Um, we also have had a state project working on some of the broader societal level changes that we know um, are both risk factors for potential violence, which includes economic stress and strain in families, um, as well as supporting and increasing protective factors. In addition to this focus on primary prevention, um, which you will hear more from us over the next year, undoubtedly, as we work to secure some ongoing funding in the state budget, we've been incredibly grateful for one-time funding in three of the last four-year budgets, but now is the time to get that on an ongoing permanent basis. Um, but in addition to that, I wanna just really reinforce how important and essential batter intervention programs are within the spectrum of prevention, right? The incredible power that helping and working with someone who has committed harm to be able to change their behaviors, to change how they approach relationships so that they no longer commit future harm, both in terms of their ongoing connection and relationship to that initial survivor that may have led to them being in VIP classes, but also in future intimate partner relationships. Right, we know that that can have tremendous positive impact. Um, and I just want to say how hard this work is, right? Skip, I appreciate everything you said and really want to commend the work that you do and that programs are trying hard to do every day to um, support these types of incredibly positive and important changes in our communities. And so I think that this conversation is hopefully one that is the first of many in which we're able to keep digging into what is needed. I think there's been a lot already raised about, um, you know, the importance of thinking about new possibilities, uh, whether that's how we structure fines and fees, who is paying for these classes, how we're meaningfully investing, what approaches are included, but there's so much conversation to have here. Um, and these are the hard conversations and the digging into what's messy that will lead us to greater solutions. So really appreciate this conversation. I know we're short on time. I wanna make sure the assembly member gets some time to speak, um, but hoping that this is the first of many more to come. Thank you, uh, Krista, really appreciate that. And the mindfulness around timing too. Um, you know, this invitation to have future conversations is something that I think we could all benefit from. And uh, if folks are willing, um, we would love to schedule a part two um, to, to really get into the questions that we weren't able to get into. In the do that without being able to uh, think conflicts. And so I think it's important for us to have a, a follow-up conversation. And thank you for the affirmation, Monique. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to turn to Assemblymember Kara now, who has firsthand knowledge of how these programs uh, have really failed to produce safety and healing. Uh, Assembly Member Kara, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your leadership in the Capitol. Uh, really excited to hear what some of your reflections are um, based on what you've heard and recommendations are um, for how we proceed. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here and great to hear from everyone. I think you know, every speaker collectively um, covered, uh, I think, so much ground and it's certainly great to be uh, amongst those that are really looking for uh, resolutions uh, to how we deal with this epidemic in a way that actually creates real public safety. Uh, and, and, you, you know, I think there's a lot more that we need to do. We heard from Senator Kamlogger, certainly as policymakers, community leaders, to prevent uh, in partner violence. And there's uh, a lot of data that we don't have, but should be collecting. I think this report does a really great job of identifying things that we need to do going forward. I will say, you know, as a, a former public defender and, and um, Professor Verani, I think that uh, it shows that we need more public defenders doing policy work and doing academic work and actually, you know, you know uh, offering up solutions because the reality is we've seen on the ground 
that what we've put forward as supposed solutions aren't solutions at all, at least not if what we truly want is public safety, the safety of, of both victims as well as those uh, that, are, that, that have been traumatized on both ends of the spectrum in terms of those that commit violence and those that are victimized by violence. Uh, the reality is there's a lot of trauma that exists uh, that needs to be healed. Uh, we know that, and I've seen as well as, as prof the professor that these court mandated battery intervention programs in California have less efficacy in our structure really uh, around our criminal justice system, uh, which has been structured uh, in, in a way that is designed uh, to, to further traumatize those that get involved, both the victim, as well as those that get convicted, those that end up certainly in jail and prison, which in themselves are, are centers of violence and, 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 and um, you know, create further trauma, as you indicated, Mark, uh, through your experience. And, you know, we have seen, you know, there's certainly other states that have innovated, there's certain counties that have looked at ways, things in different ways to reimagine intervention programs uh, as public health oriented practices and policies so that uh, we can intelligently intervene uh, to stop the cycle of violence. And our current system really does need bold and systemic intervention to make a meaningful difference on the, these preven preventable issues. Now, the problem is the issues, you know, uh, may be preventable in terms of we, we may, you know, through, through reports like we're reviewing today and, and, and through, you know, our collective work, we may have a pathway towards a solution. The problem is the politics, right? It, you know, as uh, the Senator indicated, these aren't real, these aren't easy issues for us to tackle because they have such a stigma attached to them. When you talk about domestic violence and, and, and the, the, the correct, I, I think the rightful kind of anger that it creates. But the problem is that anger doesn't lead to solutions that actually end the violence, nor does it lead to ending the trauma because it, you know, we, we, we recognize that although we definitely wanna make sure that victims are made whole and are healed, the current system doesn't do that. Uh, and all it does is further victimize in many ways. Uh, in, in my experience as a public defender, certainly we can see that these programs don't create sustained safety for survivors or opportunity for healing and ending the violence. It perpetuates the violence in many different ways. It doesn't address the trauma and the needs that people have who are trapped in cycles of violence. I remember um, when I was working uh, in a domestic violence court and the, the one running the court was Judge Sharon Chapman. And I would have long conversations with her about it. She's now you know, unfortunately passed away, but I think that she definitely had an impact in terms of trying to expand the sense of, of what we need to do uh, in terms of addressing the trauma that in most cases the men had uh, that, that were coming before her. You know, let's think of, and I would talk to my clients all the time and learn so much about their past and how, and, and remember one thing that we don't do a good job of, you know, with, with so many of my former clients, when they were children, they were victims of violence or they witnessed violence that traumatized them yet their trauma wasn't dealt with they like many children supp suppress um, what they're experiencing and so um, we have to be able to recognize that and recognize that locking up the parents of these children um, isn't you know making those children better off when they get older it's just it's just creating a traumatizing experience uh, for them, whether they're boys or girls, uh, the, the girls are far more likely to grow up to either abuse or more, far more likely to be abused. And the young boys certainly grow up to be much more likely to be involved and to be, be abusive in intimate, intimate partner violence. And if we, know, we, we already know that we've known that for a long time, we're not putting the resources there. And that's why we need to take a public health approach, not a punishment approach to end these cycles of violence, establish better leadership from the state level, certainly on down. And, and we need to educate our legislators that it, it's not about punishing, it's about healing. And that will ultimately reduce and, and ultimately hopefully end the violence that victims are facing as well. And so the policy recommendations I think are really appropriate for us to follow through on, uh, particularly reimagining intervention programs to be restorative and culturally specific, a major issue that I think exists uh, with the lack of culturally specific battery intervention programs. The whole 52 week class as mentioned, look, you know, if, if, you're, if you're working class and maybe you get your license suspended because of conviction, uh, you can't go to work anymore. I mean, th these are layers and layers of trauma um, that are stacked upon it and, and, and keep, and these programs, 
you know, you miss one class at the start all over again. Well, there's a, there's an incentive for these programs to continue, you know, have you come for a year, two years, two and a half years before you graduate your program, as opposed to what's the real outcome we're seeking. And that's where one of the recommendations on collecting, evaluating and program outcome measures is so important. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the recommendations, but I, I really look forward to working together and I, um, uh, on these recommendations. I want to thank everyone for participating today and, and helping to educate me, and certainly uh, thank the Alliance for Boys, Men, and Color and their partners for organizing this informative and thoughtful conversation as part of their Healing Together campaign to build safe and accountable communities and end intimate partner violence. We have that same goal. The question is what really leads us to achieving that goal. And so I hope that all of us take uh, away from today's briefing better ways for the state to help Californians reduce and prevent and recover from intimate par partner violence. And you certainly have a partner in me in Sacramento and, and, and Senator Kamlager, but I, I hope this is the beginning uh, of real legislative policies that can move us in that direction. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Assembly Member. Back to you, Tasia. Thank you, Assembly Member Kalara, for emphasizing the importance of our policy recommendations and for your leadership in this space. And thank you all for being a part of this discussion. Um, thank you to our speakers for the perspectives that you've brought and to our audience for your insightful questions and comments. Um, I wish we had more time and could dive deeper into the questions, um, but I see a lot of interest in having a part two. So that's definitely something that we will start planning for and um, we'll provide you all with the information. We'll be following up with a recording and um, just some follow-up information following this briefing. So thank you all again for joining today and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.